was on November 15th, 2014, when 40-year-old Sergeant Michael Walker, an Army medic, returned home at approximately 6 a.m. after working a night shift at the Tripler Army Medical Center in Honolulu, Hawaii. He walked upstairs and found his wife, 38-year-old Catherine Walker, bloody on the floor of their primary bedroom. He quickly called 911. Military police officers arrived at approximately 6.40 a.m. and it took Walker 90 seconds to come down and answer the door for law enforcement. According to the first responding officer, Walker appeared to be on the phone with his chain of command. He escorted the officer to the bedroom where they saw Catherine on the floor with a bloody knife next to her body. First responders showed up shortly after, pushing past Walker and the officer. Catherine was pronounced dead at the scene and suffered multiple stab wounds to the neck and torso. The military police officer escorted Walker downstairs, asking him to wait outside while they checked on his wife. He asked if he could sit on the couch downstairs, as he'd be more comfortable there, and the officer allowed this. While Walker was waiting on the sofa, he told the officer that he tried to perform CPR but was unsuccessful. Walker was an army medic and he knew what he was doing. However, the officer noted that Walker was clean, with no signs of blood, which was odd quite bloody. Walker was later asked to move to the front porch while the officers processed the scene. While in the porch, the first officer on the scene stayed with Walker. Not long after, agents from the Department of the Army Criminal Investigation Division CID arrived and asked Sergeant Walker if he could come to their office to answer some questions. Walker didn't object and went with the agents willingly. The two had been married for 11 years, and according to friends, they'd always seemed so happy and sounded like the perfect couple. They were both involved in their church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Catherine had talked with friends about wanting to start a family. To everyone they knew, they had a wonderful marriage. Catherine was proud to be a military wife and she loved to travel and the life that she had built with Michael. Before we proceed, I've got an exciting surprise for you. We've launched a brand new channel dedicated to intriguing content such as old historical mysteries, cold cases, and particularly chilling horror stories perfect for bedtime. Drop a comment letting us know if you're a fan of horror stories or not. You can find the link in the description below. Let's find out who will be the first to explore it. All right, let's dive back into the video. During the interview with CID, many questions came to light. Spouses are almost always asked questions and are very often the first suspects. When they arrived at the CID office, a military building, Walker was asked to give up his cell phone, which is normal procedure. The agents then escorted Walker to an interview room, where they asked him to hand over his clothes for evidence, just in case something had transferred when he performed CPR on his wife. After, an agent interviewed Walker, asking the normal questions, like if he knew who might have done this to his wife, where he was at the time of the murder, what his alibi might be. Walker had a solid alibi, which was that he was working a 12-hour shift to the hospital, with lots of witnesses that saw him there. At one point, Walker suggests that his wife might have committed suicide, which was later found to be impossible based on the placement of the knife wounds. Walker was never put under arrest at this time and he was free to leave whenever he liked. However, he stayed and after lunch, now more than six hours after finding his wife murdered, the questions shifted dramatically. The agent started asking if he had any relationships outside of his marriage. He would admit to having affairs with both men and women, having had sex with men for money, and he mentioned a woman named Lisa. He also admitted to being a sex addict. Authorities then started to look at any of Walker's current and past affairs. Over the next few months, they went through emails and phone records. They talked to as many of his past affairs as possible. Some didn't want to come forward because they had families. They eventually narrowed in on one woman, the one that Walker mentioned in his interview, 29-year-old Elisa or Lisa Jackson, who at the time of the murder was living with her parents in the same neighborhood as the Walkers. Elisa Jackson worked at a movie theater and was supposed to work on November 16th. However, she was reported to have come to work, left shortly after, and had not been seen again. Jackson had moved to live with family in Indiana suddenly. She was arrested in April 2015 for first-degree murder. She was extradited back to Hawaii, Jackson confessed, and told the story of why she had killed Catherine. Elisa Jackson and Michael Walker had met online in September 2014, they'd started an affair quickly. 
Elisa often came over to the house when Catherine wasn't home. After one sexual encounter, the two were sitting on the couch talking. Elisa stated that she had opened up about her mental health difficulties. They spoke of their greatest desires. This was when Walker talked about his greatest desire to be free of his wife, but that he couldn't afford to divorce her. He spoke about the $400,000 life insurance he had on his wife, that they could be together if she was gone. Greatest desire became a code for the couple. Quote, I want you so bad it's like a craving, Jackson wrote to Walker a month before the murder. Quote, I know, me too, Walker replied, if only someone was out of the way. I know, Jackson said, they had many texts and email conversations on the topic, but wanting each other. In one email conversation, Jackson talked about needing Walker's permission believed to be permission to kill his wife. Walker then gave that permission in a following email. On November 4th, Jackson attempted to go to the house, but it was locked and she left. A text conversation followed, quote, I need my desire taken care of soon. I'm going crazy, Walker said to Jackson. She responded, quote, I know daddy cakes. I was going to, but ran into a problem. Authorities believed it had been code that she couldn't get into the house and that she had an access problem. He wrote back, oh, I see I can help with that. On November 14th, 2014, Jackson and Walker met at the gym parking lot on the military reservation, a usual meetup spot for them. They created a code that Walker would type good if Jackson entered through a window or bad if she was supposed to use a hidden key in the back of the house. Later that day, Walker texted her, bad. Elisa Jackson arrived at the house around midnight and retrieved the key hidden in the backyard. Upon entering the house, she got a knife from the knife block in the kitchen, walked upstairs to where Catherine was sleeping in bed. Jackson began to attack Catherine, however. She woke up and stood out of bed. Jackson then forced her to the floor where she stabbed her several more times. Jackson said that while she had stabbed Catherine, she had asked for her forgiveness and Catherine had replied yes. Jackson waited on the bed for 30 minutes while she watched Catherine take her last breath. She then went through Catherine's purse, looking through her wallet and looking at her ID. Jackson took nothing from the house. She then went home, waited for Walker to call her. He never got in contact with Jackson after his wife's murder. This followed evidence that law enforcement found. There was no forced entry into the home, nothing was taken, but a light switch and a purse had traces of blood on them, including the ID. During Jackson's confession, she revealed that she had been diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. At the time of the murder, she'd been off her medications due to a lapse in health insurance, and that the entire time she'd been with Walker, it had felt like one big manic episode. Elisa Jackson now faced a death penalty because the murder was committed on federal land. She made a plea agreement with the approval of Catherine's family to testify against Michael Walker in exchange for a lesser sentence. In December 2015, Jackson pleaded guilty and was convicted to 30 years of first-degree murder. In November 2015, Michael Walker was charged with the murder of his wife, Catherine. He pleaded not guilty and was initially supposed to stand trial in mid-2016, but in 2016 he was court-martialed with charges of creating child-explicit images, the sexual assault of a minor, and physical assault of a minor. While investigating his computer for evidence related to his wife's murder, they found inappropriate communications with a young boy, to three years in prison for possession of inappropriate child materials, and ten years for the assault of a minor. Also in 2017, he filed an appeal to have some of his original video interviews removed from the records as his lawyers were arguing it violated his Fifth Amendment rights. He won that appeal because they hadn't read him his Miranda rights, and during the interrogation, the agent had asked questions after he had invoked his rights for legal counsel. This included information about the affairs, but not the information found on the cell phone. While serving his 10-year sentence in September 2019, Michael Walker pleaded guilty with a plea agreement that he would serve 30 to 33 years and take the death penalty off the table. In February 2020, Michael Walker was sentenced to 35 years for first-degree murder, five more years than Elisa Jackson. District Judge Susan Oki Malway said she sentenced Walker to more time than Jackson because he was the one who orchestrated the murder saying, quote, Miss Jackson wielded the knife that killed your wife and that was a terrible, terrible deed. But it does appear that you were in control and she did what she did because you wanted her to 
and you knew she had mental problems. Walker has since been dishonorably discharged from the military. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. Before we continue, 90% of you haven't subscribed to our channel, so if you like this video, please subscribe. It motivates us to make more content for you. Okay, let's continue. On August 3rd, 2002, around 12.30 a.m., Glenn Godfrey, 53, and his wife, Patricia, 52, returned home. Glenn and Patricia had been married for 35 years, and they had four children and 13 grandchildren. He had just retired as commissioner of the Department of Public Safety on June 30th. The two had recently taken a trip to Afjanak Island. They went fishing, hiking, berry picking, and kayaking. The couple were scheduled to leave on August 6th for Switzerland for the 35th wedding anniversary slash retirement trip. The two had been home for about an hour and were in the living room when Patricia started to make her way towards the kitchen while Glenn went to the entryway of the home, opening the closet. Then they were confronted by a woman who jumped out of the closet and she immediately shot Glenn twice in the stomach and once in the head. The woman ran towards Patricia, shooting frantically, hitting her four times in the leg, stomach, and chest. The woman started to fuss with the gun. Expert believe it may have jammed or ran out of bullets. Then she bolted for the garage. Patricia made it to the bedroom where she called 911. She told the dispatcher she'd been shot, her address, and her daughter's phone number. During the 911 call, Patricia reported hearing another gunshot, and she believed that the woman had shot herself. It would take first responders 48 long minutes before they could reach Patricia due to an error with dispatch. They followed the address given by the computer instead of using the address provided by the victim. The address was one of about 5,000 not on the map in the database at the time. Several officers had been interviewed and had been given multiple different addresses that they had been told to find the victim. It was reported that dispatch had upset Patricia so much she'd hung up on them more than once. She then attempted to call her kids for aid instead. Dispatch did get her to stay on the line, and Patricia prayed for herself and her husband. She begged them to find her, told them that she was in pain, and thought she was going to die. She yelled that all she wanted to do was talk to her kids. First responders did finally find her house. When first responders finally arrived, they found Glenn and the woman deceased at the front door. Patricia alive but in critical condition. Patricia's right arm bone had been shattered. She had a severed colon, leg injuries, and one shot to the chest. However, no major organs had been hit, and after a few surgeries, it was discovered that she'd make a full recovery. The woman was identified as 33-year-old Karen Brand, a vice president of Alaska's Chamber of Commerce, a woman Glenn had been having an affair with for the past year. Glenn had recently ended the affair, and he had recently reconciled with his wife Patricia after they had separated for some time. Brand had no drugs or alcohol in her system at the time of the shooting. She had also been harassing both Patricia and Glenn with several menacing phone calls in the days prior to the attack. The gun used was a .44 caliber Magnum pistol registered to Glenn Godfrey. Police believe that Karen had gained access to the gun while she was in the home, and instated that they didn't believe that there had been any plans before that day to murder. In 2004, Patricia received a settlement for the city of Anchorage, Alaska, totaling $700,000. The lawsuit alleged gross negligence and a violation of the right to confidentiality concerning a delayed response to Godfrey's 911 call in 2002. Patricia is believed to still be living in Alaska. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. On Wednesday, July 15th, 2015, 50-year-old Sandra Barnett, wife of ex-NFL Buffalo Bills player Buster Barnett, she was on the phone with a friend when a woman came banging on the door saying, quote, open this door, open this door, or I'm going to kill you. The friend reported to hearing Sandra say, are you Lisa Brown, before the call cut out. The friend tried calling back with no answer. She then tried calling the police but didn't live in the area. So she called a mutual friend. He immediately went and drove by the Burnett house. He then saw a woman standing next to a black Dodge Durango. When he pulled around, it was gone. 
He called the police and a search for Sandra had started. On July 16th, the Durango was spotted in Clayton County, Georgia. Police gave chase and Alabama state troopers joined when the SUV crossed state lines. The SUV eventually stopped in the middle of the I-20 in Claiborne County, Alabama at mile marker 208. A standoff started, and it would end when Lisa Brown retrieved a gun from the back seat of the car, shooting Sandra in the head before shooting herself. Both women were pronounced dead at the scene. In the SUV, they found handcuffs and a receipt that showed they'd been purchased hours before the abduction. It was later discovered that Lisa Brown had gone to Buster Barnett's work on the morning of July 15th because she was upset that he'd planned a vacation with his wife to Las Vegas. Buster actually owned the Durango Lisa had used to abduct his wife. Buster had been having an affair with Lisa Brown for years. Police believe that Brown left Buster's work with the intention of abducting Sandra. After knocking on the door, she forced her into the SUV. Police never found what had happened to the woman between the abduction on July 15th and when they were spotted and chased on July 16th. This was also not Lisa's first kidnapping. She was on probation out of Texas for kidnapping her child, who she lost custody of. It had taken authorities more than three days to track her down then. Sandra was a beloved teacher at the McNair Middle School, where she worked with kids with special needs. Sandra had married Buster in 1987. However, in 2011, Buster filed for divorce. Initially, he was granted the divorce in 2012, but it was overturned when Sandra said she never received the papers, saying that they were sent to the wrong address. It is unclear if Buster was living with Lisa at the time. Buster filed for divorce again in 2015, and there was no information about why they were going to Las Vegas. Lisa had reportedly been harassing Sandra for years prior to the abduction. Lisa had several mental health issues, which included violent and suicidal tendencies. She'd been in a two-year relationship with Buster, he owned the home that she lived in, and it is believed that the two shared a residence together. Buster won control over his wife's estate, saying that he had no involvement in the kidnapping or murder of his wife. Courts ruled in his favor because he had never been convicted in civil or criminal court. There is no evidence that he knew what Lisa Brown was planning to do. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. we proceed, I've got an exciting surprise for you. We've launched a brand new channel dedicated to intriguing content such as old historical mysteries, cold cases, and particularly chilling horror stories perfect for bedtime. Drop a comment letting us know if you're a fan of horror stories or not. You can find the link in the description below. Let's find out who will be the first to explore it. Alright, let's dive back into the video. For 27 years, a woman known only as the lady in the fridge has laid unidentified. In March 1995, a bottle picker searching for bottles and cans came across a submerged refrigerator in the Whiskey Slough Canal near Bacon Island Road in Holt, California. Curious, he waded over to the fridge and opened it up to inspect its contents. The fridge door had been tied shut and when he opened it, he made a disturbing discovery. Her hands had been bound with tape and a sock had been stuffed inside her mouth. The authorities were immediately called, but none of the attending officers could have prepared themselves for what they were about to see. Medical examiner determined that the woman had been submerged for around six months. However, the internal temperature of the fridge had been quite warm, which had led to accelerated decomposition. They estimated the time of her death to be somewhere in October of 1994. Caucasian with strawberry blonde hair, 110 to 130 pounds, between the ages of 29 and 41. Her cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma, and investigators were keen to uncover her identity, but that would be easier said than done. Jane Doe became known as the lady in the fridge, and missing person reports from across the country and beyond were cross-referenced with her details, but no one matched. Investigators continued looking into her case, but it became colder and colder as the years went by. Each year investigators would glance over the case files, hoping something new would stand out, but nothing ever did. Her details were entered into NAMAS, but still no leads came up. Then in 2022, the San Joaquin County Sheriff's Office contacted Othrim, asking for their assistance. 
the skeletal remains of the lady in the fridge were handed over to who were able to extract a DNA profile. Using genealogical techniques and databases, Othram was able to find the possible mother of the lady in the fridge. All the San Joaquin County Sheriff's Office had to do was obtain a DNA sample. Finally, in February 2023, Othram and the San Joaquin County Sheriff's Office announced that the lady in the fridge had been identified as 30-year-old Amanda Schumandatza. At the time of her disappearance, Amanda was separated from her husband and was a mother to three children. According to friends and family, she was last seen in Napa, California at an unknown apartment complex with an unidentified male friend who she had met at a rehab facility. Investigators believe serial killer Terry Rasmussen may be involved in Amanda's disappearance and murder, although nothing has been confirmed yet. Her children, now adults, are thankful for law enforcement and hope that her murder investigation can now be solved. They said in a statement to the media that they look forward to moving on with their lives. Their mother's disappearance had always been an open wound and has brought them some comfort knowing that their mother never abandoned them. Amanda was known to frequent the Napa, Oakley, and Delta, California areas. There's a $10,000 reward for tips that lead to an arrest. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. On December 11, 1989, two tourists making their way down Old Temple Bar Road in Mojave County, Arizona, just 50 miles from Las Vegas, made a startling discovery. At the side of the road lay the body of a young woman who had been stabbed multiple times. Her clothes had been removed, and it was clear to onlookers that she had been attacked where she fell. The Mojave County Sheriff's Office took over the case and began their investigation. The medical examiner determined her time of death to be around 24 hours, but there was no sign of her killer. In 1989, there was very little evidence to work with and her case quickly ran cold. In late 2021 or early 2022, the case was reopened with fresh eyes and a new approach to crime scene investigation. Fingerprints from Jane Doe were obtained, which led them to the potential identity of a woman named Maria Ortiz from Bakersfield, California. When the family of Maria were visited, they could not recall anyone by that name, but they did remember that their cousin, Maria Ramos, had disappeared sometime in 1989. A DNA sample was obtained from a close relative, and sure enough, it was a match. Finally, the 1989 Jane Doe was identified as Marina Ramos, who had been 28 years old at the time for disappearance. 14-month-old Elizabeth Lisa Ramos and 2-month-old Jasmine Maria Ramos disappeared around the same time. Witnesses were called seeing Marina in the company of a man known as Fernando, who was in his 30s or 40s and drove a black SUV. According to reports, Marina, Fernando, Elizabeth, and Jasmine were headed from Bakersfield, California to Ontario, California, before she mysteriously disappeared. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. It was on February 28, 1980, when two men, a father and son duo, were sifting for gold and making their way along Fly Creek in Clark County, Washington, when they came across human remains. The exact location of the body was close to NF-54, where it split with Canyon Creek. According to reports, the remains were almost intact aside from the torso and hands being missed. The remains were said to be mostly skeletal. In the report, the medical examiner concluded that the remains likely belonged to a young woman, aged 13 to 18, although most likely in the 15 to 16-year-old range. Her cause of death remained undetermined, and there was very little information the medical examiner could garner from her remains. She was believed to be Native American or Hispanic and had well-developed neck muscles, indicating she was likely involved in sports or manual labor. The case quickly went cold and investigators were eventually assigned to other cases. In 2016, the NCMEC and Nikki Costa of the Clark County Medical Examiner's Office created a new 3D rendering of her face from her skull, giving us the first lifelike shot. This photo was widely circulated but again generated no leads. Then in 2019, the Clark County Sheriff's Office made a shocking announcement had been identified as 16-year-old Sandra Sandy Morton. According to reports, Parabon Nanolabs aided in Sandy's identification, 
although the exact methods used have not been released. Also at that announcement, they stated that Sandy is likely not a victim of the infamous serial killer Ted Bundy, and anyone who had known Sandy around the time for disappearance is asked to come forward. Sandy was born on April 29, 1962 in San Francisco, California, with the family moving to Washington State when she was still young. In 1971, Sandy's parents divorced and she went to live with her father, Andy Morton, who lived and worked in Vancouver, Washington. Andy's job often had him working out of town, so Sandy often lived with friends or relatives. According to Coin News, Sandy would last attended Wilson High School in 1966 to 1967. She was due to enroll at the Newburgh High School in late 1977, but failed to attend her first class. Ever since then, her whereabouts had been unknown. Sandy's family had no idea that her remains had been found just miles from where she had lived, and it has not been stated whether she was officially reported missing. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. In June 1988, a farmer walking through his fields 20 miles outside Springfield, Colorado discovered skeletal human remains. The Baca County Sheriff's Office were immediately alerted and several more parts of the remains were discovered. Baca County Sheriff's Office searched the farmer's field for several days, finding several items of clothing, gray corduroy Levi pants, a size 34 B bra, and a beige winter coat with faux fur collar and cuffs. A 1986 quarter was found in one of the pockets. The Baca County coroner was not able to determine the cause of death only that the remains had been in the field for between one to three years. According to the Doe Network, most of the skeleton had been bleached by the sun and parts of the spine was still attached. Coroner estimated that the remains belonged to a woman aged 16 to 22, possibly Hispanic, Native American, or European. The coroner also noted that the woman had extensive dental work, including two silver cast crowns, the technique of which suggested that she was from Mexico or close to the border. Unfortunately, the case ran cold quickly. Dental records were sent to dentists in the area, but no matches were found. Dental records and a DNI profile were also submitted to the National Crime Information Center, which led nowhere. The woman was eventually buried in the Springfield Cemetery as a Jane Doe. The Baca County Sheriff's Office never forgot her case and vowed to get answers. In 2021, the Jane Doe was exhumed and a new DNA profile was obtained. According to the press release, this DNA sample was submitted to NAMAS. The details were murky, however, according to KOAA, it appeared that the DNA sample was submitted to Family Treat DNA and GEDMAD, public genealogy databases. From there, Michelle Kennedy, an investigative genetic genealogist, discovered a first cousin once removed. Genealogists were able to work through Jane Doe's family tree and came across possible close relatives. According to the Baca County Sheriff's Office, they were notified by NAMAS that a possible DNA match had been found. As per their press release, quote, not only was the familial DNA submitted for analysis by Solved by DNA, a match with family of Arjane Doe, but the DNA profile of a person who submitted her DNA sample to the McAllen, Texas Police Department had also linked to Arjane Doe by NAMAS. On October 6, 2022, the Baca County Sheriff's Office announced that in 1988, Jane Doe had been identified as Nora Alia Castillo. Nora's daughter submitted a DNA profile to the McAllen Police Department in 2004. Nora was reported missing in 1996 with reports stating the last time she made contact with her family was sometime in 1986 or 1987 via a phone call from Colorado. What do you think about it? Tell us your thoughts in comments below. Let's continue. It was on March 29, 1975, when 16-year-old Sharon Pryor left her home in the Point St. Charles neighborhood in Montreal, Quebec. She left around 7.30 p.m., leaving her person home. Sharon was meeting a group of her friends as well as her boyfriend at a pizzeria only blocks away but never arrived. Sharon was a sweet and bright teen. She had a caring and nurturing nature and had a particular affinity towards animals. She had dreams of becoming a veterinarian. She was known to be kind and warm and was a remarkable student with a bright future ahead. The oldest of four siblings, she was an excellent big sister and always set a good example for them. 
No one alerted Sharon's parents when she didn't show up at the pizzeria as her friends had assumed she just stayed home that night. It wasn't until hours later when she missed her curfew that Sharon's parents figured out her disappearance called law enforcement. Initially, detectives weren't concerned and felt that Sharon had probably just gone off with her friends, but her parents weren't convinced. Sharon always called home if there was a change in plans and was always home on time. She didn't have a history of running away and in her bedroom was all her money and bus pass. As precious time passed, detectives eventually concluded that Sharon had been abducted, likely in the alleyway behind their home and on the way to the restaurant. No one saw or heard the abduction. Sharon's mother, Yvonne, remembered something. She said that Sharon had mentioned a strange man had been following her when she'd been walking home a few evenings before. Sharon had started getting male friends to walk with her home after dark. Detectives also believed another attack about an hour before Sharon's disappearance may have been connected. Blocks away from the alleyway Sharon may have been abducted from, 23-year-old Cheryl Roy was attacked a bit before 7 p.m. She was walking alone on her way to the pharmacy to grab diapers for her daughter when she saw a man walking in towards her on the other side of the alleyway. She said that he had his hands in his pockets and looked like he lived in the area. She didn't notice anything visually concerning about the man. She said he seemed very normal and thought he would just continue walking past her and she would go on her way. She continued, then suddenly heard footsteps running towards her. And when she turned around, she was shocked when the man that had walked past her was barreling towards her. The man grabbed her and pushed her against a building. She fought off her attacker screaming and yelling. He had a knife which he pressed against her throat, telling her to shut up. She cut herself on the blade, pushing the knife away. She begged the man to take her purse, and he said, quote, I don't want your purse. I want you. I love you. She said he grabbed her hair and was trying to drag her to an empty lot. He was saying, quote, You're dead. You're not getting away from me. When I get through with you, I'll cut you to pieces. She screamed and struggled for about six minutes. Then a group of young boys started to run towards them. They had been investigating the screams. Cheryl knew one of the boys and called out to him. This forced her attacker to back away and run off. After the man ran away, she was helped into a nearby home and called the police. She described the man as about six feet tall, 200 pounds, Caucasian with a mustache. She said he only spoke English and didn't have a French accent. He spoke in a calm, low voice during the entire attack. She also noted he didn't smell like alcohol, and she never got a good look at his face. Cheryl lost her voice for two days from the screaming. The man had tried to rip then cut her pants from her body. She thanked the kids for coming to her aid. After the attack, she felt that if she had passed out or hadn't made so much noise to attract others to help, she would be dead. Though unlike in Sharon's case, she didn't feel that she'd been stalked by her attacker. She didn't feel like she'd seen him before. The attack had felt completely random and unprovoked. It had been early in the evening in a well-populated area. A bold attack. Detectives felt that two attacks in the same evening in the same area were not a coincidence. Cheryl did her best to work with police sketch artists and came up with this rendering. The sketch went around the neighborhood, but no one recognized the suspect. Detectives then turned to finding Sharon Pryor. Three days later, on April 1st, a local beekeeper's neighbor called and said that one of his gates to his far pastures was open. He hopped in his truck and went to investigate. Snow was still on the ground and it was still too early for him to be opening up the hives, so during the winter months he didn't really bother with checking his fields routinely. When he got to the gate, he noticed it was indeed open. The gate had a padlock on it, but he never actually clicked the lock down. It appeared that someone had come by, popped open the gate, and driven onto his field. He followed the tire tracks, initially assuming some kids had gone onto the property to joyride, but then instead discovered something shocking. In some bushes, what looked to be a pile of clothes, a suede jacket. But in the clothes was the body of the missing teen, Sharon Pryor. Sharon was found naked from the waist down. Her jeans and underwear were recovered five feet from her body, caught in a bush. Detectives as well as a medical examiner believed that she'd been deceased for one or two days before she was discovered, coming to the conclusion that someone had held her captive for the weekend before dumping her body in the field. 
Her cause of death was blood aspiration. She had been severely beaten. Her autopsy showed that she had a fractured jaw, a broken nose, and multiple broken ribs. At the crime scene footprints were also recovered near Sharon's body. The impression was photographed and preserved. The tire tracks in the snow were also very clear, giving detectives a good idea of what type of vehicle they were looking for. A man's shirt had also been used to bind Sharon's hands, and tape had been used to cover her mouth. Based on the footprint impressions and the size of the shirt, they believed they were looking for a man around 6 feet tall and 200 pounds, which matched the body type of Cheryl Roy's attacker. Detectives weren't able to locate the man that had attacked Cheryl, nor identified the suspect that abducted and murdered Sharon, though always believing it was likely the same suspect. Law enforcement even put out a $10,000 reward for information. However, without a suspect, the case eventually went cold. In 2004, the case was reopened with the help of a tip. Detectives began to investigate a neighbor that lived a few doors down from the prior family. Detectives tore apart the garage on the property, believing it had likely been a garage near the abduction site that Sharon had been kept in for up to three days before she was killed. The garage was behind an apartment building and had been used to house garden and building maintenance tools of the building owner. With Sharon's murder occurring just before spring, it seemed like a perfect location to hide a kidnapped individual, knowing no one would need to come into the garage until the snow melted. They tore apart the building, even digging deep down into the soil below, looking for anything that might indicate Sharon had been there, but nothing was found. Likely too much time had passed, and again the case went cold. In 2023, new detectives opted to reopen the Sharon Pryor investigation, looking towards genetic genealogy to find answers. They started the investigation from scratch, finding male DNA on the male shirt that had been used to find Sharon's hands, as well as on her clothing. They sent the DNA off to genetic genealogists, who were able to slowly piece together the unknown man's family tree. One surname popped up, Romine and law enforcement started to look into prior arrests around the time of Sharon's murder, and a suspect's name turned up with a lengthy criminal history in both Canada and the United States. Franklin Maywood Romine. Born in 1946 in West Virginia, Romine had started his criminal career as early as 16, starting with petty theft and destruction of property, escalating to a vehicle theft at 18, and going all the way to breaking and entering, stalking, and sexual assault in his 20s. He had previously been incarcerated in 1964, but escaped prison and fled to Canada. He frequently bounced between Canada and West Virginia, racking up warrants in both countries. In 1975, he had been meant to be in prison in the U.S. but had fled to Canada in between sentencing hearings. In that case, he had stalked a waitress who had turned him down, broke into her house, and sexually assaulted her at knife point. Between the constant fleeing the country and escaping prison, it's unclear why he'd been released to the public. But who knows? Months after Sharon's attacks in Montreal, he'd been arrested by local authorities and extradited back to the U.S., where he was sentenced to 10 years in prison. He served six in prison before being released. He died in Canada in 1982 at the age of 36, and it's unclear how he died. His death certificate was never discovered and his body was sent back to the U.S. for burial. He was buried next to his mother in Putnam County. Colquay's detectives reached out to Romine's living relatives, which included surviving brothers. His brothers weren't surprised that he was being investigated for murder. One of his brothers said that he had been estranged from the family years before his death. Franklin had attacked his brother's wife trying to sexually assault her. After that, the rest of his family had nothing to do with him. Franklin Romine was known to be unpredictable, violent, and aggressive. He had never been a suspect in Sharon's case, though he bore a striking resemblance to the police sketch that Cheryl provided to law enforcement. At the time of the murder, he was 28 and lived 9 kilometers or 5 miles from the prior home. The tire tracks in the original investigation were also matched to a vehicle that Romine had purchased while in Montreal, and the footprint found at the crime scene also matched his shoe size. Detectives petitioned to have Romine exhumed, though his family protested legally. While they had provided DNA to give a familial match, they didn't want their mother's grave disturbed. They felt that, with the proximity of Franklin's grave to their mother's, it would be impossible to exhume one without disturbing the other, 
but the judge ultimately approved the exhumation. DNA was extracted from the remains uncovered and was tested against the DNA in Sharon's Cole case, and it was a 99% match. Romine's DNA has been entered into federal databases in both Canada and the U.S., and his DNA is now being tested against multiple Cole case murder victims. The FBI has also stepped in and is working with law enforcement agencies on both sides of the border to assist in determining any potential victims with similar circumstances. Sharon's mother, Yvonne, now 86, as well as Sharon's twin sisters, were given the news that her murder was finally solved after 48 years. They attended the press conference and spoke about who Sharon was before her murder, as well as thanking detectives for solving her cold case.